Air Marshal Hupfeld, thanks for, uh, for bringing us together again here. Uh, pretty unique occasion. And uh, I think after two years, a good two years of, of COVID, um, I think we're all glad to be able to meet physically again. So thanks for, for organizing that and, and allowing us to be here together. And I think it's good uh, for us all as we sit here um, that although, be it at the other side uh, of the globe, uh, in Europe, right now, there, there is a war going on. And, and who would have thought that a few weeks ago, uh, that that would happen? And I think that stark realization uh, of what's going on in, in Ukraine um, also is something that drives home, I guess, what's going on right now, uh, and that the world as we know it, as we knew it a few weeks ago, has changed. And the way I, I always uh, like to talk about this, uh, this realization is that when in the Netherlands, which is in the west part of Europe, we look around us and we see how far away from us, about an hour and a half, about 1,300 kilometers from our capital, from Amsterdam, there is this war going on, and that's the same distance uh, that we have from Amsterdam to about the south of France, that brings home a message that this war is closer to us right now in Europe than we would want it to be. In those three weeks that we've been in that operation uh, with the NATO allies, um, we, we have learned a lot of lessons uh, already. And in my short talk, I, there's just a few things I'd like to share with that on you or, or on you with uh, about that um, and also connect that to some of the trends and challenges that I see in our air and space domain as, as we work together as a coalition. This slide depicts our neighborhood right now in, in Europe with an aggressive Russia uh, that invaded a sovereign nation, Ukraine, with a lot of activity connected to that, including a, a vast flow of refugees uh, right now, more than four million refugees out of the Ukraine flowing into Europe, but also other nations. Uh, and that brings home uh, a message that something is really happening there. Up north, we see everything happening there also related to, to climate change, uh, the waters uh, becoming more available uh, different flows happening there um, and in the high north obviously together with the Scandinavian countries also as the Dutch forces we're looking at what that means to our security in the south um, in uh, the Sahel area in Africa obviously there is a lot happening there as well we have a lot of operations there that we are conducting with our with the nations together um, and there we see also the threat of, of terrorism uh, that is still there and uh, will not go away uh, for the foreseeable future, as we expect. And on the left-hand side of this slide, um, you see some other domains that sort of overlay all of these uh, things happening in Europe, uh, things that are happening in the space domain, uh, and we've heard a few things about that already, and we'll probably hear more about that over the next uh, day or so. Space is becoming more and more contested, so what does that mean for the availability of, of products that we need from space. We see the effects of, of cyber activities, um, and that is actually cyber connected with info wars. It's also fake news, those kinds of things are also injected in what is happening with the war in Ukraine and the, the effect it has also on our people and the way the people view this war and, and look at its facts and its realities. So if I can go to the next slide, there's just a few things that are connected to uh, the, the phase that we're in and this, this war that is happening in Europe and the operations that we are in as NATO right now. Uh, there's just a few things I'd like to uh, share with you. First of all, and, and this term uh, was mentioned already before uh, today, uh, and, and that's a term uh, uh, called gray zone ops. Um, for the last 20 years, I would say, it was sort of almost a neat division 
between war and peace. Peace we had at home, uh, in Europe, we were all safe and secure, and the operations we have done over the last 20 years have been expeditionary. We have done operations in Iraq and Syria, we have done operations in Afghanistan, we were involved in operations in, in Africa, and obviously we were involved in operations nationally also. And the pandemic that we've just witnessed and we're still in, in the last bits of it, at least let's hope so, that, it, that is the fact, is also an example of a national operation that I think in all our nations had a, had a big impact and where the military also played a role. But that normal uh, of war and peace and also the wars of choice, I would say, the, the operations of choice that as nations we have been in, has now rapidly changed to uh, a war of necessity. And that is all about defending our, our NATO alliance against threats, uh, in this case from the East. And it requires almost new rule sets, because now we're operating not in this clear-cut situation of war and peace, of at home and away on, on, on a mission uh, somewhere far away, but we're in this gray zone where within our nations we are generating sorties and I think this goes for all of us and I'm looking at the European air chiefs here, Ingo, Mike, uh, we're all involved in these, these operations generating large amounts of sorties from our air bases and flying sorties from our home base uh, about an hour away to the eastern border of our NATO alliance, flying long missions five to six hours with air refueling uh, and then sustaining that for a longer uh, period of time. It eats up a lot of hours right now. Uh, at any given time, there's probably about 100 aircraft alliance-wide that are involved in this operation on our eastern border. And it eats up a lot of capacity. It eats up a lot of hours. It, uh, it forces us to ramp up our sustainment efforts. And this is just for the operation as we're doing it right now, which is basically air policing. Imagine what would happen if Mr. Putin decides to cross the Article 5 threshold with NATO, which would force us to ramp up the number of sorties that we fly and the efforts that we put into this operation and what that would do with our sustainment efforts. Um, and that is something which I would say shrinking air forces over the last 20 years that brings home the realization that we need to invest once again in expanding our capability and in increasing numbers as well. A second point that's on this slide is, is understanding. If there's one thing that we have learned from, from the operation that's going on right now, the importance of understanding what's going on on the ground. In this case, uh, in, in, in the country, Ukraine, in the neighboring countries, in Russia, uh, in Belarus, in all the, the in the Baltics, on, in the nations around uh, the, the 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 area that we're talking about, uh, and understanding indicators and warnings, and investing in capabilities that allow us to understand that better, uh, I think realization with most European countries is that we really need to make a step forward there. Right now, we're still relying a lot on U.S. assets that have been deployed across. Uh, from uh, across the Atlantic to Europe, and we need to work harder on, on working that, uh, that part of the puzzle as well, creating situational understanding. And what doesn't make that easier, and I'm saying that also as a nation that operates F-35, an aircraft with a special access program, for all the good reasons, uh, but if you have a lot of those special access programs in an operation, you will also see some stovepipes starting to exist. So then the question also becomes, so how do we cut across those stovepipes to ensure that th those cutting edge, cutting edge capabilities are able to connect, are able to talk to each other, so that as a coalition we are able to share that situation understanding much better. Because I think there's a big risk of creating stovepipes with all these high-end um, uh, capabilities. In the end, it's all about deterrence. And I think what we're doing now as NATO is, is really putting a clear line in the sand on, on how far Mr. Putin uh, can go. And 
sending a clear message on our unity, sending a clear message on our deterrence, on our posture, uh, I think that helped bring home that message uh, with, with him as well. So then the question becomes, what does deterrence mean now and what will it mean in the future? How will we posture ourselves as air forces, flying missions from home base, but also forward deploying, uh, doing more dispersed ops or, uh, across our nations? How do we sort of organize that? How do we ensure that we are able to, to generate sorties from regardless uh, which air base in Europe? So those kinds of concepts which used to be common knowledge, I would say, uh, in the past, um, before we went into all the expeditionary operations, we need to now rediscover and figure out quickly on how, how to be effective in that arena as well. I think a lesson that we have learned also from being uh, in this operation is that lead turning uh, is, is becoming once again really important. And I guess lead turning is, is a term that as fighter pilots we know well, uh, and, and when we talk about that we, tr we like to use our hands like this. Um, but lead turning really, lead turning at the merge, trying to understand your opponent, trying to understand what uh, the opponent will do, trying to predict uh, his actions uh, will become more important. And I think that will also go back to information sharing as a coalition, how effective are we? How, how well do we understand the need to share information such that we have a common operational picture and we can act accordingly in that gray zone? Speed and robustness, those two combined together, I would say, really um, is something that we know as, as airmen and airwomen. Um, but this operation shows really the importance of speed. First of all, understanding what's going on and then having a push button option available as an alliance, as a coalition to react really rapidly. And I think in that sense, the classic understanding of speed, and, and it's something that we, I guess, as airmen understand really well, makes us, um, as, as it's being talked about within NATO circles now, that air is really the maneuver force. Of course, there's lots of activity in the land domain with a lot of forward presence going on on the eastern borders uh, of Europe. There's a lot going on in the maritime domain, but air is really the maneuver force right now because we are able to react so quickly and respond with effects that are timely and are, uh, are relevant. But I think looking to the future and, and looking towards trends in general in regardless which operation, I think it's not just about speed at itself, but also our speed of change. So are we able to accelerate our change in all those developments in air power such that we can meet new scenarios rapidly? And the robustness connected with that, I guess, is also about mass, about being able to operate 24-7 again, generate sorties from our home bases, have the numbers, being able to operate in two shifts. And trust me, uh, when I look around the room, I think there's a couple of air chiefs uh, here uh, with us, uh, including myself, that look at their organization saying, hey, we've built an organization over the last 20 years which is really equipped for one-shift operations. And now we go to two shift operations again, uh, so we need larger numbers, and we need to be able to uh, sustain that. But robustness is also about fourth and fifth gen integration. And I think we have invested in that with the introduction of F-35 and all of our nations, working together with fourth gen assets. And I think what we see right now is then that we are effectively able to employ both uh, assets together and be really effective. But it's also going to be more and more about manned and unmanned teaming. Uh, and I would like to put a challenge to this room uh, that I think we need squadrons in about five years from now that are able to operate in a manned, unmanned, swarming, teaming type scenario. And are we able to do it? Is industry able to provide us uh, that option in just that short matter of time? Resilience, we heard a lot about, um, so I won't go into all the definitions that I guess we've already heard and uh, talk and a, a few people 
which are a lot smarter uh, than, than I am, have, have discussed this topic already. But I would translate resilience not just in the info domain or the cyber domain, which is a hot topic, I guess, in all our societies when we talk about resilience, but what this operation that we're in right now in Europe also drove home to us again is the fact that it's also about physical resilience. So are we able to protect our key points in our nations? Uh, are we up to that task? And that is actually a whole of government task. It's not just the military that needs to do that. And I think that the, the age that we're in right now drives home that message that we need to invest in those kinds of capabilities as well. And I would like to close off with unity. I think in a scenario that we are witnessing right now in Europe, but I would say in any scenario, unity is our best weapon. And as we sit here together as nations from all over the world, I think unity is something that we continually need to work on. Uh, and unity is about standards. It's about being able to operate and train together with our, with our weapon systems. And our men and women are really good at that. I think we can be confident in that. But it's also about relations. And I think events like this, and once again, Air Marshal Hupfeld, I think you have created an event where we are able to work on those relations. And I think that is an important part of providing the unity that is part, uh, I think, a very important part of a solution in all the scenarios that we will be working in as a coalition. Thank you.